as a kid, I remember so well, you know, meeting older people in town, and they ask my name, and I say, you know, tell them, you know, Del Bianco, and they go, oh, your grandfather, God bless him. He carved my, my mother's tombstone, or my father's headstone, and they would have this, like, reverence for my grandfather and it, it made you know quite an impression on me in fact somebody said to me years ago I tell everybody that the chief carver of Mount Rushmore carved my father's headstone and I just thought what else can be said I could remember uh, being that same age and whenever Mount Rushmore would come up on the television on a commercial or an image of it anywhere, my older sisters or my parents would say, oh, Grandpa did that. And I remember thinking, wow, <laughs> he did that? <laughs> he carved, he, you know, I just remember, but I didn't quite put it together until I was in second grade and I found um, this old yellowed brochure about Mount Rushmore from the 30s. I had incredible documentation about my grandfather and that Mount Rushmore, very politely, has been uh, refusing to acknowledge that that documentation, you know, is more than enough proof to give him credit and recognition as Chief Carver. The policy that has been in stone, no pun intended, for like 80 years, that all of the workers would be you know, grouped together uh, was still going to stand. And so the secretary who typed memos and the laborers who moved stone would be in the same classification as, as the guy who, you know, put soul into Lincoln's eye. This is in 1933 when Borglum was, um, brought my grandfather out to Mount Rushmore because Hugo Vila uh, was not working with Borglum anymore and he needed uh, someone else to assist him. And uh, he writes, in 1933, I notified Tallman and my son Lincoln, who was here pointing, that I was bringing with me as an assistant a semi-sculptor who had been with me off and on in the East for 12 years, a powerful, capable granite man whom I had converted into an efficient marble cutter. I was immediately notified that his presence here was objected to and that the Rapid City office did not want him. I ignored this and put him immediately in charge of the work and workmen on Washington's head, meaning the face and wig. Bianco has all of Villa's ability plus power and honesty and dependability. We could double our progress if we could have two like Bianco. Now I've decided we must keep Bianco and keep him happy. If he were working for me, I would pay him 11 or $12. I want him to receive a dollar an hour. You may charge me with the difference. The help he is. The ability to understand is worth much more to the work. When he was uh, feeling a little stronger on certain days, I would help him out of bed, this little five-year-old kid, and he would take me into a room and he would show me this, this bust of himself, a self-portrait that he did out of white Carrara marble. And I remember when I saw it, I, I thought it was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. And he would take my little five-year-old fingers and feel the, uh, his marble profile. I put, I put his own fedora on his own carved head, and then he would take me by the shoulders, very serious voice, and he'd say, hey, I am Luigi. You are Luigi. And, um, you know, I truly believe that, even though I knew him for such a short time, that he wanted that connection between the two of us to be known, because he, he passed away very soon after that. Yeah, I'm trying to reach Cam Sholly, please. Yes, I've left uh, several messages. My name is Lou Del Bianco. I'm the grandson of the Chief Carver, Luigi Del Bianco, and I have some you know, really important information I want to share with Cam. I just got off the phone with Cam Sholly. He is the director of the Midwestern region of the National Park Service. So I explained to him as much as I could, you know, what my family's been going through and what their reaction has been. And he proceeded to, and I can't blame him because it's the information that was given to him, he read back to me the party line, which was that Luigi Del Bianco is uh, in several photographs in the Workers' Museum. He is mentioned in several books in the, uh, in the, in the bookshop, and he has listed as, uh, he is listed um, in one of the uh, record sheets, you know, work that was done that day. And I said, yeah, you know, I... I know. <laughs> I know. I know that he's mentioned, but he's not mentioned as the chief carver. 
and he's not acknowledged as the chief carver, and his story is not being told. He has a unique story. He was head and shoulders above everybody there. He told me that he was going to go to my website, which he had not been to. He was going to read through everything, look at all the videos, and he promises me that he will make a very, you know, fair decision. I remember when my mother told me about my grandfather, I was so excited that I opened up that booklet and I started looking for him. You know, I just, every, every man that was on the mountain in those photos, oh, was that him? Oh, no, that's not him, he's too small. Oh, wait, there's a hat he's wearing. Maybe that's the hat that I put on his uh, carved head. No, that's not it. And just pouring over the booklet over and over again and just realizing that he's not there. So I couldn't find him. And uh, I didn't realize at the time as a seven-year-old that I couldn't find him because he was hidden. You know, who was hiding him, what, how, I, I don't know. All I know is that my journey looking for my grandfather and his worth on, on that mountain started with that seven-year-old boy, you know, looking for him in that booklet. Sharing these documents, talking about how my grandfather was considered by Borglum to be the only uh, tr trained carver on the mountain who understood the language of the sculptor and he was worth more than any three men in America, all of that stuff. And when Cam heard all of that, he, he was impressed. He said, you know, this is, this is uh, pretty compelling stuff. I said, yeah. I said, you know, Cam, I've heard that before. Many uh, people before you were impressed as well. But then somewhere along the line, it all went south. I'm hoping that maybe you'll be different. And uh, he was. <laughs> he was about as different as you can get. I got a call a couple weeks later, and it's Cam Sholley. And he says, I want to propose something to you. I said, yeah. He said, I uh, would like to send the head historian for the national parks and one of our really esteemed historians out of Missouri to come to your house. I will fly them, see you personally. And they will sit and they will go through every single document with a fine tooth comb and then make a recommendation either way as to whether your grandfather deserves to be recognized beyond the other 400 people. We sat at the dining room table. I made copies of the books for each of them. And basically the book consists of 61 primary source documents from the Library of Congress in chronological order from 1933 to 1940 that involves my grandfather's participation, you know, as Chief Carver. I basically wrote an outline of what they were to expect to read and how these documents would prove his importance. And then wrote a wish list as to how I'd like him to be recognized and why. And so we just literally sat down and, and, and went through them. And uh, by the third document, Mr. Sutton said, wow. I said, this is, this is really uh, impressive. And, I, and it was at then I was like, hey, this is nothing. <laughs> I said, we've just started. This is, this is like a taste. And it's true. I mean, so already the historians were, were probably thinking, you know, why did it take this long? So when I started getting to the really meaty documents, like, you know, he's worth any three men in America for this type of work, I just, you know, I... I just lost it. I just got really emotional. I mean, I, I must have, for many reasons, you know, whether it's the fact that I'm sitting on the shoulders of people that came before me, like my Uncle Caesar, who, who did the research at, um, at the Library of Congress and wouldn't live to see this, this day. Uh, I'd like to think that he knows in his own way. Um, and just, just the buildup. It's like a uh, it's like a pressure cooker, you know, it just every, it comes to a point, culminates, and then boom, before you know it, what you've hoped for is actually happening. You've got a willing audience of historians and primary source documents. I'm not a historian. I'm a storyteller. But what do storytellers do? You know, the word story is in history, right? The first thing they said was, you need to know that for the Midwest Regional Director of the National Parks, to fly out two historians to your house, you've got to know that he means business and he's taking this very seriously and he's looking for our support. We have every intention to go back and recommend that your grandfather get recognized.
Congress has given us an incredible mission. We protect some of America's greatest places and we tell America's most important stories. The memorial represents the perseverance of the American spirit. An incredible team, 400 men and women over a 14 year period. You think about it during one of the darkest points in time in American history, the Great Depression, truly uh, the epitome of a team effort. And since everybody in here has been on a team at one point or another, you also know there are key players that play pivotal roles on a team at every, any given point in time. And Luigi was a key player in an incredible team of players here at Mount Rushmore. As Americans, we can be very proud of what this memorial stands for. Yes, for the pivotal moments in the past that we shouldn't forget, but also for the optimism we should have in the future. Luigi was a key part of that effort. And like this memorial is standing in perpetuity for the enjoyment of current and future generations, Luigi will always be part of this special place with the team, recognized properly for his role as Chief Carver. Good morning to Mount Rushmore, in the greatest country in the world, the United States of America. It is with a full and grateful heart that this ceremony to honor and recognize my father, Luigi Del Bianco, as Chief Carver of Mount Rushmore, after many years, is deeply appreciated by myself and my family. And now, it gives me great honor to introduce my nephew, Mr. Louis Del Bianco. Finally, I'd like to thank my grandpa, who, when I was born, insisted that I be given his name. Grandpa, I did not know you well, but I will never forget your Roman face your long sinewy hands and your tired voice beckoning. Come Luigi, give your grandpa a hug. I'm ready to do this. Thank you. Three, two, one. When it finally comes together, the reward is just so sweet. So right now I'm just feeling the sweet reward and just sweet gratitude. Gratitude. Someone was forgotten and now he's been found. He's changing American history in a very important way. He was a chief carver on Mount Rushmore. He was my grandpa. I mean, that's all, that's all I can think of it. <laughs> The first person I ever remember hugging me in my, in my whole life was my grandfather, was Luigi. And when I'm unveiling that plaque, I feel like it's my hug back to him. And I feel like this is my way of embracing him uh, and letting him know that even though I knew him for a short time, that I've always loved him and was proud of what he did and that this whole journey was so worth it, so worth it. So it's a hug, it's a, I am Luigi, you are Luigi. <laughs>